If you've watched older videos on this channel, then you might know that I have a kind of personal history with Good Charlotte. I won't get into the entire story, but they were the first band that I fell in love with back in like fifth or sixth grade. They're the band that taught me to love music, taught me what music could be, what it could do for people. Even though I don't listen to them anymore, they will always hold a special place in my heart because I don't know that I would be where I'm at in my life, doing the things I'm doing, caring about the things I care about, if it wasn't for the music that they made 25 years ago now at this point. So amidst all of the hate and the pushback that they constantly get, I will never say a bad word about Good Charlotte, I just owe them too much. Also, if you've watched past videos, you might know that I love making videos around bands and artists that people ask me to make videos about. That's not this one. This is this one's just for me. Listen up, cause there ain't nothing funny I want a hot girl and a little bit of money I want a little house with my bank in it Cause we're tired of moving every other weekend Joel and Benji Combs were born in Waldorf, Maryland, which is kind of like a smallish area outside of Washington, D.C. in 1979. They had an older brother named Josh and a younger sister named Rachel. Their dad bounced around a lot between jobs, mostly working as a butcher and a house painter, and really struggled to make ends meet for the family. If you've listened to any of their albums, particularly the first couple, you'll probably know that their father wasn't the best. He was an alcoholic and pretty abusive, specifically to their mother. Joel said, quote, if he came home and his shoes weren't in the right place, he would just start going off. One time I saw him rip a phone, like in one motion, rip the phone off the wall and throw it at my mom, like he was pitching a baseball, end quote. When they were 16, after getting into a fight with the twins' mother on Christmas Eve, their dad walked out of the family. Benji tried to get into contact with him a few years later. He said, quote, I was willing to put it all aside. And basically he was like, I'm trying to start a new life. I'm trying to forget about you guys. The last time I ever talked to him was on the phone that day, end quote. Once he left, that's not really a scar that I think ever fully healed. And the twins ditched his last name and started going by Madden, taking their mother's maiden name. Their mother suffered from lupus, made worse probably by the stress of suddenly being a single mom of four kids, so she was in and out of the hospital, meaning the twins had to pick up a variety of odd jobs in high school to try and help make ends meet. So they worked at grocery stores and pizza places and really anywhere that would hire them, and they frequently got fired from those jobs because they would just ditch them whenever they booked a show, because the band was always more important. So a, a comment told me I had millennial hair, so I'm self-conscious about it now. High school wasn't really the best time for them, You'll pick up on that if you listen to their first record. They got bullied quite a bit, and it led to them kind of hanging out with the social outcasts at school. They said that in their teenage years, when they looked around them, they were surrounded by these people who were in a depressive, hopeless state, and they saw no drive or passion in those people to get out of that. But growing up as twins, Joel and Benji had each other, and they kept telling each other over and over that they had what it took to get out of this and to make something different and better out of their lives. If one of them started feeling particularly down, like maybe we're not good enough, maybe we can't do this, the other twin was there to speak that encouragement into it and be a cheerleader and really kind of keep the motivation going. And that drive and passion to do something different and to break out of the hopeless state they were in is what led them to music. They saw all of these bands who were doing something and making something out of their lives, and they started to wonder how they managed to do that. One Christmas when their mother couldn't afford presents, a friend from church gifted them a guitar and a bass, and they started learning how to play it, and maybe they could be one of those bands that broke out and did something different. They first started writing songs when they were really young, Benji said, quote, I had gotten a guitar and I learned a few chords, but I wasn't really good enough to play other people's songs. So we were like, let's just make up our own song, end quote. He also said that when they first started writing and practicing those songs, they weren't great, but he knew that it was something that they could be good at. He saw that there was something to it that just kind of clicked with them. And with practice and determination, he knew that they could do something with it. And then in 1995, they saw the Beastie Boys and that 
changed everything. Benji said, quote, We sat almost in silence, watching the show in awe, just going, I feel like we could be up there. Then all of a sudden, our sights were just set on it, and that was it. We never looked back, end quote. They gravitated towards that DIY aesthetic, largely because that's all they could afford, particularly in the style of clothes they wore. They started one band that I think was called the Benji, Joel, and Brian band, but I couldn't verify that, so it might be wrong, but that one quickly fell apart anyway. So they turned to their friend Paul Thomas to talk about forming a new band. Paul Thomas was born in 1980, and his dad was a cop, but that didn't necessarily mean that Paul liked playing by the rules. He was expelled from high school for threatening to punch the principal. Paul started playing guitar originally, but he switched to bass when the Madden Brothers asked him to join their band because Benji already had a guitar and was already trying to learn that. Paul met the Madden Brothers when Joel went to a homecoming dance with Paul's sister, and they quickly bonded over a shared love of music. Paul said, quote, They asked me if I wanted to jam with them. I said, yeah, that's great. I showed up and nobody knew how to play anything. That first band practice was me showing Benji how to play some chords. He caught on so quickly that by the next practice, a week or so later, he had written seven songs with the chords that I had shown him. They also recruited their high school friend Aaron Escalopia to play drums and... He's a guy that's kind of not talked about a lot. They don't mention him in a lot of the interviews that I watched. I'm not really sure why that is. It seems like he played a pretty big part in the early years of the band in determining the direction of their sound, so... I'd love to learn more about him. Let me know how I can do that. But with Paul on board, the brothers started to put everything that they could into this band. They would wake up early, go to school, leave school, go work whatever job they happened to have at that time, go home and work on the band until three or four in the morning, get what little sleep they could, and then wake up and do it all over again. They started to educate themselves and read everything that they possibly could, but not necessarily about like musical theory or how to write a pop song. They were reading about how to get a band signed, about how to be successful, because that was their focus. That's what they wanted to do. So they would practice. They would read these music industry magazines. They would put together press kits to send out to little indie record labels and radio stations to try and get their music any kind of attention. From the very start of the band, they had just this insatiable drive and this naive belief that they could pull it off. Joel even failed a social studies class because... The semester was all about preparing you for college, and he knew, I'm not going to college. My band's going to be successful. They started to play some local gigs for like 15, 20 people, even though they barely knew how to play their instruments at this point, and Joel would have to like face the back of the stage because he was too nervous to actually sing and be a frontman. Despite really wanting to drop out of high school, they managed to graduate so that they wouldn't disappoint their mom fully, and then they moved to Annapolis, where the music scene was at least a bit better, and that's where they met Billy Martin. Billy was born in 1981, and he was brought along by a friend to see an early Good Charlotte show. He bonded with the Madden brothers over their shared love of an Australian group called Silverchair, but Billy was already in a band, and he liked the more new metal and aggressive sound, which Good Charlotte definitely wasn't, even back then. Good Charlotte really wanted another guitar player to help fill out the sound, and they kept pestering Billy to join the band, or at least try it out, but in Billy's mind, he's like, I'm in this, like, aggressive cool band so why would i join your band but the whole time he really loved their songs he said that a lot of the songs on the first album they had been playing since like the start of the band and they, those were really interesting to him and he thought it'd be fun to give it a try so when his band which was called overflow broke up he decided to take them up on it and he joined good charlotte billy said that when he joined the band he definitely didn't fit stylistically he had like long dreads he loved new metal he didn't even know who blink 182 was until they toured with them he just wasn't a pop punk kid or a punk kid at all Walking on street to tea. Joel and Benji said that these early days of the band, they were just so naive and had no idea how little they knew. Benji said, quote, We matured very late. We had no life experience. We had never been to New York. We had never been to LA. We had never been anywhere. We didn't fly on a plane till we were 18 or 19 to California, and the band was already well on its way. We were so green, and we came into an industry. We didn't know the world would be critical, end quote. Pretty soon through sheer force of will and by taking the opportunities that came their way, the band started to get a little bit of attention in the local area. They opened for a ska band called Save Ferris in Philadelphia, and at that gig, they left behind a demo tape of their song Little Things. That demo kind of bounced around 
between a few people and eventually it landed in the hands of some concert promoters who worked in that kind of mid-Atlantic area and they started to book Good Charlotte on some bigger shows. So they were the support on some of these East Coast tours with bands like Mest and Some 41 and Lit and Little Things got a little bit of local radio airplay. So while this attention was building, record labels started to take notice. In 2000, they did a showcase in New York City that led to them being signed by Epic Records. Billy said that when they signed, he was still a senior in high school. That's how like young and naive they still were at this point. And then on September 26, 2000, they released their self-titled debut album. Although critics really kind of enjoyed it, the album didn't sell all that well, and it led to them being almost dropped by Epic. And soon after it was released, Aaron, the drummer, left to join his brother's band, Wakefield. Eventually, the band released a couple of videos for Little Things and Motivation Proclamation, and those started to get a little bit of airtime on MTV. They also landed a great spot on an MXPX tour, so Epic decided to give them another try at a record. So in early 2002, they went back to Los Angeles to start work on their second album. When they started recording their sophomore album, they still didn't have a full-time drummer. They tried out a couple different people, but no one really clicked, so they used Josh Freeze from The Vandals as like a session musician. That album, The Young and the Hopeless, released in October of 2002, and it was their mainstream breakthrough. Joel said that they were trying to create a hit album, and that Young and the Hopeless, quote, felt like the generation we were in. I think it was the way a generation felt in the early 2000s everything started to change over, end quote. The lead single from that album, The Lifestyles of the Rich and the Famous, which I think released like a month before the album, was their first major breakthrough hit, but it also almost never happened. Joel said he really struggled to finish writing that song and almost gave up on it at several points. He said, quote, me and Benji would get into fights about it, and then one day I went in alone and just finished it in a matter of 20 minutes, and when we gave our record company the album, they were like, Lifestyles is a great song, and I was like, really? End quote. Then they wrote the song Boys and Girls after being turned away from two different nightclubs in one night and watching the social strata that was happening around them and being really amused by it. The album debuted at number seven and ended up selling over five million copies. While on Warp Tour in 2002, the band The Youth introduced them to Chris Wilson, who became their new full-time drummer, and they started a relentless touring schedule trying to get the most out of this massively popular album that they possibly could. They were in a scene that was famous for its partying and its debauchery, but at least at the start, they were a little bit different in how they approached it. Most of them drank a little, but they weren't that like hard partying rock and roll stars that we've come to know and love. During those early tours, Benji learned that he also suffered from alcoholism just like his father and just like his grandfather and who knows how many other people up that family chain. He started drinking way too much and getting into a ton of fights at their shows, so by the early 2000s, when things were really taking off, he decided to quit, and he went sober, and the other guys wouldn't drink around him. But with this great success came a lot of pushback from the punk community. Good Charlotte looked like a punk band. I think they had the knowledge. They were listening to Minor Threat, Social Distortion, like all of these kind of legendary hardcore bands, but their music by design was poppy and made for mainstream success and if there's one thing the punk community doesn't love it's bands trying to get mainstream success so they were constantly harassed by people in the punk community whether that be punk bands or fans mostly fans and were constantly asked by interviewers if they considered themselves punk and what they thought about that kind of pushback and criticism. During an interview with Rolling Stone in 2003, Joel said, quote, You're probably the first person who hasn't focused on why we are or are not punk this whole interview. It's very cliche for rock and roll journalists to go, well, you're not punk. We don't care if we are. We don't care if we aren't. As Fat Mike said, quote, They started just like all the rest of us did. A bunch of punk kids that liked Minor Threat and Rancid. Whatever their career became, who cares? They are a punk band. End quote. They were also called industry plants quite a bit. People thought that they were like this punk boy band that record labels put together because 2000 was like the height of the boy band craze. They also each kind of had their distinct styles, so that played into that boy band imagery, but Billy said that that's just how they were. They weren't being characters, they were just being themselves. Benji was way more into that punk scene, and he loved bands like Rancid, while Billy was, as we've already said, way more into new metal, and he loved bands like Nine Inch Nails and Korn. So even though they were just being themselves and displaying their interest, 
the label knew how to market a boy band, so it kind of leaned heavily into that direction and started presenting them that way, even if that wasn't the original intention. Billy said, quote, I think it was a little bit our personalities, what they were, and the record label thinking, oh, we can double down on this and use this to our advantage, end quote. I think it's worth noting that through this massive exposure that Good Charlotte was getting, they were able to bring some of these punk bands into the mainstream. I know the first time that I ever even heard of Minor Threat was in a Good Charlotte song. I think it was Riot Girl, where he said she likes Minor Threat, she likes social distortion, like... I didn't know what that meant at the time, but that was the first time I had ever heard of Minor Threat. And I know I'm not alone in that. She's got tattoos, LPC, she likes they were wearing merch by like obscure punk bands in their music videos and on TRL. They were also way ahead of the curve on blending punk and high-end fashion and blending punk and hip-hop. Finn McKenzie at the Punk Rock NBA did a really good job of kind of explaining how they were pioneers in this area, so I'll just link his video in the description below. Make sure you check that out if you're interested in that whole aspect of their career. But all of this newfound fame and attention came with quite a bit of a dark side as well. Joel started to really struggle with addiction and anger issues. He said, quote, All of a sudden, my life was one big opportunity to do whatever I wanted. That sounds great, but because I could get unlimited alcohol and drugs, they're everywhere on the road, I got really out of control with partying. Not only was I confused about how to just be myself, but I didn't know how to deal with fame. Half the world loved us and half totally hated us. So I'd get so wasted at after parties and my dark, angry side would come out. Every time I got drunk or high, I tried to fight someone, end quote. But he kept all of that pretty bottled up and didn't share it with the rest of the guys. And that led to this moment after their Japan tour where the rest of the band went home and Joel stayed behind for a little bit and tried to decide if Good Charlotte was even something he wanted to keep doing. He eventually did go back to California and decided to go into therapy and to get sober. Joel and Benji later talked about how The Young and the Hopeless brought them everything that they were looking for when they were 16 and just starting out in this band. It brought them money. It brought them fame. It broke them out of their small community. It broke them out of this cycle of depression and dead-end jobs. But they said that it didn't feel like they had escaped anything. It felt like they still had to keep pushing. Should I call? Should I even count on you? In 2004, they released their third album, The Chronicles of Life and Death, which peaked at number three. The label wanted to lean more into like a top 40 mainstream sound, but the band decided to make this album darker and more introspective. It was definitely different than their previous stuff and is still a polarizing album in a lot of ways. While I was writing this, I went back and listened to it again for the first time in probably over a decade. And there's some songs that hold up. There's some that don't. So I don't, I don't know how I feel about it even today. Once again, the band went back on tour to support a new album, but their drummer, Chris Wilson, was in therapy for some issues he was dealing with. So he had to step back for a bit. Also in 2004, Joel started dating Hillary Duff, and they kept it quiet for about a year, probably because Hillary was 16 and Joel was 25, which is undeniably creepy and not a great look. Hillary's mom publicly announced the relationship in 2005, and they made their first public appearance together at the VMAs that year. They said at the time that it was a very slow-moving relationship, and Hillary said that Joel treated her better than any boyfriend ever had. But a lot of that probably was just PR talk. I also saw in an interview at the time that Joel said if he had a daughter, he would never let her date someone that much older, which is kind of weirdly hypocritical. I don't I don't know what's going on there. I can't even pretend to unravel all of the complexity of that issue. It's worth noting that as I'm recording this in 2024, they are really good friends. They're neighbors. Hillary is really good friends with Joel's wife. Joel is really good friends with Hillary's husband. They go out on like double dates together all the time. Their families just appear to be really close. So it seems like if there was any leftover trauma from that, then at least on the surface, it looks like they've worked through it. I hope they have. Anyway, Good Charlotte got back into the studio in 2006 to start working on their next album. After writing and scrapping at least two albums worth of music, they pivoted away from that darker thematic stuff that they had been doing on their 
past couple albums and went in an entirely different direction. Joel said, quote, We wanted to keep away from all the dramatic and dark overtones that we've been doing for the last four or five years. Everyone else in our genre of music is getting really dramatic, so we figured, let's go somewhere completely different. So it's a little bit dancier and the music feels really good, but it's still good Charlotte. End quote. Benji described it as that feeling of waking up and knowing it's going to be a good day, and he said the goal was to get back to having fun playing music like they did on their first album. It was also the first album that Joel worked on while he was completely sober, which was a new hurdle for him to overcome. Good Morning Revival released in 2007. The album featured a lot more keyboards played by Billy Martin and was super hooky. Critics were split on it. Billboard placed it number four on their list of the worst albums of the year, but it did hit number seven in the charts. Joel seemed to be really proud, if not of the album itself and the music on it, but of the band's decision to go in that direction at that point of their career. He said, quote, We could have tried to make The Young and the Hopeless again, but that, to me, would have been giving up. End quote. That album was also the first to feature Dean Butterworth on drums. Chris Wilson had left the band after a tour, citing health difficulties, but a year later, he took to MySpace to kind of air out some grievances, and it turns out it was not as amicable of a split as everyone had us believe at the time. He railed against the Madden Brothers, saying that they never paid him any royalties on the songs that he had played on, and he never had any cut of the merch sales, so he stressed that they still owed him a ton of money. He also said that they took his drum equipment and refused to give it back. He said, quote, The reason why I lost my mind was because I joined a band with two of the most egotistical, self-centered, backstabbing, corrupted individuals who are filled with broken promises. Joel posted his reaction to that and said, quote, It's right for you to be mad, dude, but you're mad at the wrong people. Be mad at the people who did drugs with you, people who encourage you to act like a loser. Get into a good recovery program, take some time off, and get some good sobriety, and you'll be way better than than this bitter dude you're becoming, end quote. He also said that Chris wasn't good enough at drumming to even play on their songs anymore, and he stressed that the band did not owe him anything. The band posted their official response saying that Chris was paid for the drumming he did, but he was not a part of any of the songwriting, so he wasn't owed a cut of the music publishing. As of 2017, Chris owned a juice store in North Hollywood. I listened to a pretty long interview with him from around that time. It sounds like the stress of being taken from basically obscurity and just thrust into this arena rock band and playing for these sold out shows in front of thousands of people really took a mental toll on him. And he turned to drugs to escape. He said that whenever he was getting high, that was the time that he could take to himself to kind of decompress a little bit. And all of that led to him having something of a mental breakdown. Before joining Good Charlotte, Dean Butterworth had already a pretty long career in the music industry. He was born in England and got a start playing as a touring musician for Ben Harper and Morrissey, which I'm sure was a massive draw for Joel, who was a big Smiths fan. The band met him through members of Goldfinger, and then Dean turned down playing with Morrissey in order to join Good Charlotte. They supported Good Morning Revival by appearing on a lot of different TV shows like The Tonight Show and iCarly, which I'm sure punk fans really loved. In 2008, they announced that they were working on something new. Joel said, quote, I think there's a need for a new Blink-182 album, and they're not working on an album. I'm a huge Blink-182 fan, but I think in general there's a void there for music like that. And in this moment, we're making a record that kind of answers to that void. We'll see, though. End quote. Joel had already been dating Nicole Richie for a few years before this album, and their first daughter was born in 2008, so I think being a new father probably gave a little bit more maturity to what Joel was trying to do with his music. Benji had also recently broken up with his longtime girlfriend, Sophie Monk. I saw somewhere that they got married, but I'm not sure, can't really confirm that. But anyway, the ending of that relationship probably added an interesting element to creating songs for this album as well. But this album was shaping up to be more like their old stuff and less like Good Morning Revival, which made a certain segment of their fans very happy and a certain segment not as happy. But when they finished that album, they listened through it and they were really disappointed in themselves. They didn't think it was good enough. So they threw it away and started again. Benji said, quote, We were all pretty calm about it and said we'd do whatever it takes. It was the right decision. We knew the focus of this record had to be the soul in reconnecting with our fans, end quote. The album Cardiology finally came out in October of 2010. It got pretty mixed critical reviews and it hit number 31 in the charts. They said later that the album was more for the band than for anyone else. They spoke about how it awakened their love of music again because you can get kind of jaded when you're in the industry and when you're in a successful band 
just touring relentlessly, always in the studio, always doing press, can kind of turn you off to the whole music thing and you fall out of love with this thing that has now become your life. Benji said that for a while he wasn't even buying albums anymore because he just couldn't listen to music. And then Joel also talked about how his priorities had shifted and instead of thinking about the band and thinking about music all the time, now he was thinking about his children. So when he was not with the band, he was with his family and he was able to prioritize that and focus on that and it caused a bit of a shift in the Good Charlotte's direction. Even though I don't really see this album getting a ton of love in the Good Charlotte community, it sounds like it was an album that was great for the band. It helped them reconnect with their love of music, which sometimes is really needed. And then in 2011, the band announced that they were going on hiatus. Benji said, quote, We were stepping away from the grind of making records and touring for a minute just to have fun and be creative like we were when we were 15, end quote. At the same time that they announced the hiatus, Joel and Benji announced that they would be releasing music under the name The Madden Brothers, and it was a project that was way more pop-focused, not really any of the rock influences of the Good Charlotte stuff. And also during the hiatus, they all spent some time just focusing on their families. Billy had married his longtime girlfriend, a hairstylist named Lindsay, and I think Paul also had his first children during this hiatus. Billy was able to focus in on his art, which is something that he had always done. I think he even designed a couple of the Good Charlotte album covers. I want to say he did Chronicles of Life and Death, but I don't know. I might be getting that wrong. But Billy was able to get a job as an illustrator for Nickelodeon and Disney. Dean kept working as a session musician, and Paul was able to go back to school and start working on a degree. In 2015, the band announced an official end to the hiatus. Apparently, Joel and Benji had been doing some songwriting for bands like Five Seconds of Summer and All Time Low, and that just made them think we should just do another album. Dean said, quote, Last March, an email went out that said, When are you guys available to get on the phone this week? I didn't know personally after four, almost five years, what that meant. We were all on the phone catching up for a couple hours, and Benji and Joel brought up the idea to do a record. So they released their sixth album, Youth Authority, in 2016. I think it's largely looked down on now, but it did pretty well for the band. Critics generally liked it, and it charted at number 23. They tried to go more traditional pop punk with this album, and... I'll let you decide if they succeeded at that. They released their next album, Generation RX, in 2018, which was an album at least partially inspired by the opioid epidemic. They went into this album trying to make something that was fun and exciting for them first, and then bringing into consideration what fans might think of it. It didn't do all that well charting in the low 100s. Since then, probably largely on the back of this silly little thing called COVID, Good Charlotte has basically stopped. They haven't released much music, and they've all been focused on other projects. Joel is still married to Nicole Richie and they have two kids. Benji got married to Cameron Diaz and they also have two kids. Billy focused on spending time with his kids and he also worked as a producer making beats for some hip hop artists. Paul went through a coding boot camp through Berkeley College and signed up to be like a teaching assistant for that boot camp. He also has kids. The Madden Brothers seem to have entered a new phase of their career, almost a more mature, older phase of their career. They started a management company, and they seem focused on helping newer, young bands navigate the entry into this industry. They said that they wanted to be the person that they needed when they were 18 and entering this business for the first time. They said they were looking around, trying to find someone who would tell them the truth and help them and give them guidance and wisdom. They couldn't find that, so they said, we're going to be that, and we're going to help all of these younger bands and show them what it takes, teach them what deals they should take and which ones they should reject, and it seems like they really love kind of being in that godfather of pop punk era of their career. Joel also hosts a podcast for Alternative Press, where he gets to like interview a lot of these bands that they're trying to help and give some advice and stuff, which is pretty interesting. Recently, the band got back together to play the When We Were Young festival because they saw the other bands that had signed up to do it, and it was a lot of their friends, so they were like, we can't miss out on that. Billy said that that probably will lead to something else. He doesn't think they got together just for that show. He thinks eventually they'll start doing Good Charlotte again, but there's no concrete plans for anything right now. They're still all really enjoying the more relaxed pace of their current careers. So now, however long we're into this video, it's time to talk about the title. Are they underrated? I normally don't like to give opinions on this channel. I make history videos and I just kind of let 
the viewers decide for themselves after hearing the story of the band. But since Good Charlotte is a band that means a lot in my personal history, I felt like maybe we should give it a shot. So my short answer is yes, I think they are underrated, which sounds crazy considering the insane amount of success they had. But I guess I'm not talking about underrated or overrated in terms of their success. I think I'm talking about it in terms of their status within the community and within pop punk fans and punk fans. I think they are a little bit underrated in that regard. I mean, punk kids hate them. They're really looked down on, especially everything post Young and the Hopeless is considered to be terrible. Like they're, they don't get a lot of respect from music fans currently. And look, a lot of the criticism is really fair. It's bad to date a 16 year old when you're 25. There's no getting around that. That was a very weird and bad time. And sure, some of their music is really generic and kind of cheesy. I think there's an element of criticism that's kind of fair in that they like took aspects of the punk community and they appropriated it and made a lot of money out of it without actually being in the community. So they took something that they didn't really belong to and commercialized it and appropriated it for their own financial gain. And I think people really are not happy about that. And there's an aspect of that where like it's fair to be a little bit upset about that, but I think it's blown out of proportion. So I think part of that might be a little fair, but I don't think they ever intended to do that. It definitely wasn't the goal. I think a lot of this comes down to them approaching their career and their band far differently than typical punk bands and punk fans are used to. So many punk bands go into it thinking that they're not going to be successful, having no interest in mainstream success. They're just in it for the love of the music and the love of the community. And, and even though the Madden Brothers do love music, they weren't in this just for the love of the music. They wanted to be a successful big band. They wanted to drag themselves out of the situation that their family was in and make something different out of their lives. That was their goal when they started Good Charlotte. So their approach to making music is just different than someone like Ian MacKay or Greg Ginn. They just have different outlooks and perspectives on it. But even trying to go mainstream, they still paid respect to the artist that they loved, the artist that inspired them, and they always tried to give back to the community. I've gone through and listened to almost their entire discography while I was writing this video. Some of those albums I haven't listened to since like the day they came out, like Youth Authority or Cardiology. But when you listen back through these albums, you can tell the influence they had. So many bands, so many artists were inspired by particularly those first three albums. And I think Good Charlotte deserves a lot more credit than they are typically given. So that's the story of Good Charlotte. Let me know what you think below. Let me know if you knew any of this or anything was surprising to you. Anything I left out that you think should be expanded on a little bit more. Drop a comment below of any artists you think I should cover next. And then subscribe so you don't miss that video. And don't forget to leave it a like if you enjoyed this video.